Hi, Ninth and O Church family. Welcome to Devotionables, brief devotions for busy people. My name is Graham Faulkner, and I'm a pastoral intern here under Dr. Jeff Eliff, and I also teach in our singles BFG. And one of the great features of great storytelling is character development. There's a plethora of ways that great authors develop the characters in their story. They give us their backstory, they give us conflict, and they reveal their motivations. They do all kinds of different things. They do this through primarily in our kinds of storytelling, through dialogue, whether it's through a character's own voice or other commentary from other characters in a story about that character. I remember watching The Dark Knight in the Batman trilogy and that great scene between this dialogue between Alfred and Bruce Wayne, where Bruce Wayne is really trying to figure out what makes the Joker tick. Like, why does he do what he does? And Alfred looks at Bruce Wayne and he basically says, you know, Bruce, some men just really want to watch the world burn. And what is basically happening there is you have the storyteller who's pulling back the veil for us to reveal why the Joker does what he does. And then what ends up happening is everything else in that story is you realize you see the Joker through that lens. As man, he is just an agent of chaos who just wants to watch the world burn. You know, the Gospel of John, John is a fantastic storyteller, especially inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he does this for us where he pulls back the veil of motivations for why certain characters do what they do. Even in John 13, John, right before Jesus washes the disciples' feet, John pulls back the layer on Judas and says that Satan was actually working in Judas' heart at the time to portray Jesus. Well, an even better unveiling of that is John actually gives us motivations for what Jesus' heart is and what is about to happen in the back half of John's gospel. Back half of John's gospel is known as the farewell discourse. Reason for this is that Jesus is preparing both himself and his disciples for what's about to come. And John kind of gives this unveiling commentary right at the beginning in John 13, verse 1, where he writes, Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That John, before he really starts telling the story about what's happening with Jesus in this preparation, that what is the unveiling of Jesus' own heart is that Jesus loves his disciples, he loves his own, and it's actually Jesus' love that's going to motivate everything that he's about to do. That's including in the foot washing narrative, in the, like in the context of this verse. But then we know that when Jesus, or when John writes that Jesus loves them to the end, that John is setting up for us that something is that about to come. And we know that the end of Jesus here is the end of Jesus' life and what he goes to on the cross. But if you've never read the gospel before, if you can just kind of picture that for yourself, not having read this before, you're like, oh, what is to the end? And another kind of question is that the way that this verse could be interpreted is that if he loves them perfectly, if he loves them completely, if he loves them to the end of a certain point. And I think what John is setting up is that all of those things are true at one time that Jesus loves his own, he loves them perfectly, and that it's his perfect love that is actually going to take him to the end of his life. We know in John's gospel that there, John actually pulls back the veil even more for us and doesn't even just tell us about Jesus' love for his disciples. He also tells us that that love that extends to the disciples is an eternal love that actually is an extension of God the Father loving God the Son. That Jesus, when he's preparing and talking to his disciples in John chapter 15, he says that as the Father has loved me, as the Father has loved the Son, so I have loved you. Jesus says in the high priestly prayer in John 17, that he says, Father, just as you have loved me, so I have loved them. That John, this is an unbelievable picture that it's really hard to wrap our minds around that the, in the eternality of the Trinity and the communion of the Godhead, that the same love that the Father has for the Son is the same love that the Son has for his own. And what is the best picture of that love? John tells us it's the very end of Jesus' life, that love in its most perfect, complete uttermost form of the God of God the Son of Jesus for his people is found when Jesus sacrifices himself and lays down his life for his brothers. If you remember in John's gospel, Jesus says, no greater love is there than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. 
that Jesus loves you completely and that that love that he has for you, which starts in heaven with the Father towards the Son, brought Jesus to the cross where Jesus experienced the full wrath of God the Father so that he could unite you, unite us into the same love that the Father has for the Son. Now, this is just an unbelievable picture of love and sacrifice and what Jesus has for us and who we are is that in that perfect love, we're united to him. And so church family, just as we continue our study in gentle and lowly, and we're looking at where that veil is pulled back, why does Jesus do what he does? Just want to encourage you this morning or today, whenever you're viewing this, is that Jesus loves you with an eternal love. He sacrificed himself out of that love on your behalf, that out of that love that God the Father has for him in bringing him glory and by extension that he loves you, that he raised Jesus from the dead so that we could all be united in love by the Holy Spirit to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit in the Trinity. And then by extension, that's the fellowship John writes in 1 John that we have with one another. So I just want to encourage you this morning, like God loves you. He loves you eternally. And as Paul writes in Romans 8, that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That even when people reject you, when other people don't love you, whether that's your family members, friends, coworkers, that God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Spirit, they all, all three persons of the Trinity work together in their love for you and they will complete their salvation in that, your salvation in that love for you. So I just want to encourage you with that word. And then I also would just encourage you with the same and leave you with this, the same word that Jesus gave to his disciples, that as I have loved you, love one another. Just find a way as you meditate on God's love this morning to find a way to die to yourself and to give yourself in sacrifice for the love of others. Someone in your church family, your spouse, your kids, a coworker, whoever the Lord brings in your life today, think about the ways, how can I sacrificially love them as God has loved me? It's been a pleasure just studying God's word with you. I hope you find that encouraging and motivates you in your love for him and for one another.